Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Union Church of Los Angeles Combined English Language Sunday Morning Worship Service. We are so glad that you've joined us today here in the sanctuary and also out there on Zoom. Those of you who are joining us on Zoom at this time, please mute your devices. Thank you very much. For our prelude today, we're going to play a song which is uh, requested by our beloved secretary, Betty. And whatever Betty wants, Betty gets. So here is the Lord's Prayer. Well, that was a great suggestion by Betty. Good morning, everyone, and Good welcome morning. to Union Church. Um, as we prepare for worship today, just reflecting on how many times over the past couple of years we've been up here 
saying that something bad happened in the world again and reflecting on how we approach worship in the midst of that. And I think what came to my mind was we can respond to all of these things in the faith that God doesn't change. That God's goodness still remains. That no matter what the outcome is, God will be with us through suffering. And even in times when we are just watching helpless, we can use our faith to remember who God is and us using our faith is strength for people who find it difficult to use theirs and so with that in mind let us reflect on the goodness of God today let's pray Father God we thank you that you are good and that you are with us in pain and struggle. And Lord, for those we know and for those we do not know who are currently in pain and struggling, we thank you that you are with them and we thank you that you mean good towards them and that everything that is happening, you can turn to good. Lord, we worship you and we praise you for the miracles we do not see. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Alicia. At this time, please stand if you are able and join in singing our first song, which will be led by all the way from Santa Cruz, California. Jubilee is back with us today. <laughs> So please join us in singing Oceans. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine, you are mine, your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. So I will call upon your name. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine, oh, you are mine, so spirit lead me, oh, so spirit lead me where my trust is without borders, let me walk The presence of my Savior, your spirit lead me. 
song is going to be led by our own Richard Sanchez. Richard. Hey, everybody. Um, today is the, a day of thanks to the Lord, and I just want to, um, I just want to share this song. It's an old song for me. Uh, I, I, I only remember it as a child, but uh, I think we all have something to be thankful for to the Lord. Here it goes. I just want to thank you, I just want to thank you, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, I just want to thank you. The word ten men in the Bible days, they have been sick for so very long. One day Jesus passed their way And when he spoke Their disease was healed that day But they all went on Their merry, merry way And only one returned and said I've got something Something I'd like to say Yeah I just want, I just want to take a little to take time, a little right, time now right now and thank you, Lord, for all, all you've done, done for me. me. I just want, I just want to take a little take time, a little right, time now right now and thank you, Lord, for all, all he's done for me. What the Lord means to you maybe i can't see but one thing i know the lord is everything to me yes he is i remember the time when a job for me was so hard to find still the lord made a way for me just in the nick of time i remember when i was sick and my doctor said i wouldn't get well but the Lord touched my body Right now I'm able to tell I just want I just want to take a little take time, a little right, time now right now And thank you Lord For all, all you've done, done for me, me. Yeah. I, I just, just want I just want to take a little take time, a little right, time now. right now And thank you Lord For all, all you've done, done for me, me. Thank you, Lord. Everybody, sing along. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. Thank you, Lord. Yes. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. Thank you. 
for our community prayer. Today we are focusing on uh, Imago Dei, which is the image of God, um, an image that we all carry together. So I will read one, and you can join me for reading all. Beloved community, as we gather in the divine presence, in the presence of the divine, let us remember that we are all created in the Imago Dei, the image of God, reminding ourselves of our shared humanity and the spark of the divine within each of us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. As we look around, we see faces of different colors, cultures, and backgrounds. Let us remember that God's image is reflected in this beautiful diversity. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. In times of war, tragedy, and loss, we find peace in the comforting embrace of the divine presence within and among us. May we see the Imago Dei in the other. We are all fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. As we strive to be instruments of love, compassion and justice in the world, let us remember that by honoring the Imago Dei in others, we honor the Creator. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Beloved community, may this prayer be a reminder that the divine lives in each one of us, and it is our sacred duty to recognize and honor it in all we encounter. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Alicia. At this time, once again, if you are able, please stand and join in singing our opening hymn, Little is Much When God is in It. Ready? I'll give you three. And a one, two, three. <laughs> In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win if you go. to labor seems so small and little known is it great if god is in it and he'll not forget his own little is much when god is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown and you can win if you go in jesus name when the con At this time, you may be seated again. 
except for Christine and Ravi, whom I'm going to invite to come forward for our candle lighting portion. Morning. Morning. We light a light in the name of our Maker, who lit the world and breathed the breath of life for us. We light a light in the name of the Son, who saved the world and stretched out his hand to us. We light a light in the name of the Spirit, who heals the world and fills our souls with yearning. All together we say, we light three lights in the name of the Trinity of love, God above us, God beside us, God beneath us, the beginning, the end, and the everlasting one. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, oh, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine, oh, Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine, Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. It's time for the passing of the peace. So let's read this together, and then we will greet each other in the name of the Lord. Christ, Christ is, is our peace, peace. Not, not an easy peace, peace. Not, not an insignificant peace, peace. not a half-hearted peace. But may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us now. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Turn and greet Okay, everyone, let's find our seats again. I know, such great conversations. People on Zoom are sitting there, just say, went to grab a coffee or a glass of water. Pastor Ken is here, sitting with the Word of God. He's going to deliver it to us when we all sit down. There we go. All right, everyone. Please welcome Ka Pastor Ken, who's going to bring our scripture reading. Scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his word. They sent their disciples to him along with the theologians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? They left them and went away. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrite. Why are you trying to trap me? 
show me the coin used for paying tax, paying the tax. He brought him a denarius, 20, uh, verse 20, and he said to them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they said. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left them and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Pastor Ken, for that wonderful reading. And uh, we want to say good morning and welcome everyone to Union Church of Los Angeles on this 15th week of Pentecost. 15 weeks ago, we, re we celebrated the 50-day marker after Easter, so it's been that many weeks. And we are in this passage of Scripture that we've been kind of following along for the last two or three Sundays. If you have your Bibles um, in front of you, there's a, there should be a red Bible there. I want to invite you to open up. Uh, to page 802 and 803. And we're going to look at the context of this expression that Jesus is, and this confrontation that Jesus is having. It's an ongoing confrontation. As we've been sharing the last few weeks, it's very, very important to put this, this series of parables in context. So again, we're in this passage of scripture, which is the last week of Jesus' life on earth. We've mentioned in the past, uh, the past few weeks, if you're on page um, 802, chapter 21 begins with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus enters on a colt. Jesus enters on a donkey. And the shocking thing that the crowd is declaring about this Jesus, who had been preaching for three years, who had been creating disciples and creating movements who had fed 5,000 and 4,000, who had healed the sick, who had raised the dead, he finally comes into the center of power. He comes into Jerusalem, and he doesn't come quietly. The Bible says that when he comes in, the crowd calls him something that is very, very provocative. They're calling him the king of kings. They're calling him the Lord of Lords. And we're seeing in this passage, passage today a coordinated effort by not just the religious leaders but the political system to say, okay, we know that this is a troublemaker, so to speak. We know that Jesus is disrupting the status quo. And let's, let's not miss this key element of Jesus' ministry. On the last week of Jesus' life, Jesus did not seek to create some sense of consensus. He did not seek to try to barter with both Rome and with the religious institution of his time. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he came saying the thing that he was saying from the moment he was baptized by John the Baptist. Behold, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus enters Jerusalem... He enters as a king. Now, this is just, to me, I've been jokingly referring to this as Jesus' gangster moment. Amen. <laughs> he just goes in, and he's not, he's not tiptoeing his way into Jerusalem. He's going into Jerusalem, speaking truth to power. Speaking truth to power. So let's go into this passage of Scripture. Verse 15. If you look at the chapters 21 and 22, You'll see, starting on page 803, what leads up to what, we, what we're going to read this morning is a series of three parables. Jesus goes into, into Jerusalem. He goes directly into the temple. The temple represented for the Jewish people at that time not only the center of cultural life, but it was a center of religious life. And it wasn't just the center of religious life. Jesus enters Jerusalem on the last week of his life on the feast of Passover. This is the moment in which people from all over the diaspora are coming and uh, that making that yearly trip back to Jerusalem to worship God in the temple. So this is people from all over coming. People, people coming from as far as Europe, people coming from Africa, people coming from the Far East, 
Jews that had been uh, uh, spread out throughout the ancient Near East were coming to worship God and remember the moment in which God passed over. The angel of death passed over. So Jesus dies and Jesus is crucified on this very, very holy, holy week. So when Jesus comes in in verse 15, the Bible says that after having these three parables that just were, were brutal, <laughs> brutal in the sense that Jesus is not mincing words. He's saying, you guys have to get the picture. Jesus goes into the religious community, and I don't believe that Jesus is being personally offensive. We, see, we hear in this passage, Jesus says something shocking. He calls the Pharisees what? Hypocrites. Anybody that's been a believer or sought to follow God in their life, one of the things that we all dread is for somebody to say, man, you go to church and you dot, dot, dot. You go to church and you say this. You go to church and you do this. You go to church and act this way or respond this way. Friends, can I tell you right now, Pastor Ruben doesn't got it all together. Amen? If you cut me off on the freeway, you might hear some words that, uh, that are not very biblical. Amen? I, I ain't afraid to declare it. It's the truth. It's the reality. There are, there are parts of my life that just like Paul says, it's not that I've already achieved it. It's that I've determined to make my life look and model like the life of Christ, right? And Paul even talked about having this thorn in the flesh, these moments of weakness where he was like, man, I'm trying to get it together, but what I don't want to do, I do. And what I'm supposed to do, what I know I'm supposed to do, I find it very difficult. Jesus is confronting not just the Pharisees on a personal level. I don't think Jesus is, is throwing shade at the, at the Pharisees as individuals. I think Jesus is coming on this last week of the Passover and saying, what I'm presenting to you is going to force you to change everything about, about the way you understand God. It's going to force you to change systemically how people engage with God. So let's read it in verse 15. The Bible says that the fair, verse 15, then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what, in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one for you do not regard people with partiality. I'm going to pause right there. So the interesting thing is happening here. The Pharisees are looking to entrap him. The Bible says in the New Revised Version that we read, they, they sought an evil plan. Let's make it very clear what's happening here. The religious establishment wants Jesus crucified. They don't want him silenced. They want him dead. And Jesus is saying, this group here is wanting to find legal grounds by which Jesus should be put to, the, to death. I want to remind us all that on the last week of Jesus' life, Jesus was fingerprinted. He was incarcerated. He was put into shackles, and he was tried before Pontius Pilate and before Herod. Jesus was killed as a criminal. And so they're trying to find legal grounds with what's happening here. They're trying to find legal grounds by which they can bring Jesus to court. And so they're seeking ways to entrap him. You remember that when Jesus came into the, to, to Jerusalem, what did they call him? King. They called him king. So they're saying, all right, let's connect with this group known as the Herodians. The king at that time was King Herod. King Herod had a son. So the Herodians were a group of political lobbyists, if you will, who were saying, we want to keep a, a, a king. You'll recall that at the time that Jesus is preaching at the time in which Jesus is ministering the people of Israel were under occupancy they were being occupied by Rome and nothing stroked the the, the fire and the resentment of the people at that time like talking smack about Rome <laughs> it was an easy way to get the crowd on your side if you were a first gen a first century Jewish person and you were uh, um, speaking against Rome, you would have gotten a lot of support. Why? Because they were being taxed and they were being exploited. So imagine this group of people that are experiencing oppression and on top of experiencing oppression, they have to pay taxes for their oppressors. So the, the Pharisees say, listen, we're going to have to catch Jesus in this, in this. We got to catch him in the act of saying, down with Rome. 
We got to catch him in the act. And if he doesn't say down with Rome, down with taxes, well, then we're going to turn the crowd against him. The, the crowd is going to hear Jesus cower. They're going to hear Jesus, you know, try to go into this flip floppy. Well, you know, uh, all these things. So they, they, try, they sought to entrap him. This is what Jesus says, verse, verse 17. Or rather, they say, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of the malice in their hearts, one version says, or the, their malice said, why are you putting me to, a, to the test, you hypocrites? And then Jesus does something very interesting, and I want to describe why this moment is so important. Verse 19 says this, show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, whose head is this? And whose title? I want to pause there. Just for reference, again, it's Passover week. People are coming from all over the region, not just Jewish people that are in Judea, but people that are in Egypt, people that, that are in present-day Iran, people that are in present-day Iraq, Babylonia. They're coming from all their respective communities, and they're bringing the currency that they own, right, in their, in their respective lands. What was happening when Jesus enters Jerusalem is that there were money changers and they were setting up the money exchange right at the foot of the door of the church, basically saying, hey, you want to worship, you want to be right with God? This is the one time of the year where you come and you bring your offerings, but here's the catch. The Bible says in the book of Exodus that we shall have no idols before God. No idols, right? It's one of the Ten Commandments, one of the big ones. During the time of Jesus, the emperor, Emperor Caesar, was not just a political figure, or not even just a monarch. He was a deity. So when people said, hail Caesar, they were just pledging their allegiance to a political organization or even a dynasty. They were saying, Caesar is God. Caesar is above all. And so the, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, had established this, this uh, precedent. If you come in to the temple bearing the image of Caesar, it's idolatry. <laughs> that coin is an idol, right? So here's, the, here's why Jesus calls them hypocrites. They're in the temple where they have created a, a, a law that says nobody can enter the church with the coin of the king, uh, of the emperor. Yet when Jesus asked them to show them a coin, what kind of coin are they holding? <laughs> They're holding the same coin that they are forbidding everybody to enter the church with. In fact, they're the money changers. And Jesus says, show me a coin. Whose head is on that? I could imagine Jesus looking at them and saying, I thought that was illegal. <laughs> I thought that was a sin. I thought that that was forbidden. And in fact, you guys are coming to, to me, questioning me, aligning yourself with the Herodians. The Herodians were the political lobbyists and they were the arch enemies of the Pharisees. They were the arch enemy of the Pharisees. So we see here that Jesus looks past, looks past the entrapment, looks past the false, false morality test that they're trying to catch him in, and he goes straight to, them, to the heart of it. This morning for our community prayer, uh, that our wonderful sister uh, Alicia Kitamura, let's give it up for the Kitamuras, newlyweds, been married a month. Our community prayer emphasized this idea of the Imago Dei. This is a Latin term, Imago Dei. In fact, uh, Dean Ho, can you put the uh, community prayer back on uh, the, 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 the projector, please? I think you... Is it, can we do the community prayer? Um, in the community prayer, you'll, you'll see this phrase, and I want us to go into the text and see how Jesus responds. Jesus doesn't use the phrase imago Dei, but in verse 21, Jesus says, or as he's questioning them, they answered the emperor, and he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. And then here's the kicker. Jesus says, to the political and religious leaders of his time, whose image do you see on your fellow man and fellow sister? Whose image do you see? 
And then they, and then, God, they, then Jesus says, give God what belongs to God. And they heard this, they were amazed, and they went away. The early church coined this phrase in Latin called imago Dei, which simply means image of God. I want to take you back to the, to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Matter of fact, if you want to join me, uh, Genesis chapter 1. First scene, act 1, amen, the Bible. This is the beginning. This is the great creation story. I want you to go with me in verses, in chapter 1. Literally, there's no page number on it. It's page 1. Listen to, listen to the words that Moses and the Bible says when God describes each and every one of us sitting in this room. Not just each and every one of us sitting in this room, but if you drove in this morning, you might have had to make a left on Boyd. You might have had to walk through the subway. You might have had to jump uh, on the freeway. And as you got off, uh, there's no doubt that you saw somebody probably experiencing homelessness or marginalized. You saw perhaps remnants of, of the brokenness and the in inequity of our society. Jesus says what God says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26. God said in verse 26, chapter 1, let us make humankind in our what? Our imago, in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the wild things of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God is saying, I'm going to create humanity, and humanity is going to be distinct and different from the plant life, from the animal life, the, the, the distinction of humanity is that they're going to have my image on them. They're going to walk like me. They're going to talk like me. They're going to resist the animalistic urges that are a part of our humanity. And they're going to have the spark of the divine in them. They're going to walk different. They're going to talk different because they're going to walk and talk like me. Verse 27 says this. So God created humankind in his image, and in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, I want to I wanna just get right to the point this morning, amen? <laughs> Jesus is pro proposing something very challenging to the Jewish leaders of that time. And again, it's not an anti-Jewish passage. It's not an anti-religious passage per se. It's Jesus trying to spark their imagination and say, can you see the divinity, the beauty, the holiness in people who don't look like you? That's ultimately what he's saying to the religious leaders at that time. Jesus makes something very clear in the parables, and they try to butter him up with this when they come to him, and they say, teacher, we can tell you're wise. We can tell you're good because you show no partiality. You let the good and the bad in. You let the wheat and the tares grow together. You let in people from all backgrounds. And Jesus says, not only do I let anybody in and everybody in, I see the image of God in them. I want you to... Turn to your neighbor and say, I see the image of God in you. <laughs> it, is, it is very, very, we're living in times that are increasingly polarizing. We are all, I would, I would imagine, if not all of us, most of us are really torn when we hear about what's happening in Gaza, when we hear about what's happening in Palestine, when we hear what's happening in Israel, we hear about hostages, we hear about injustice, we hear about the potential of ground invasion, and we can, we can imagine the atrocity that may be up ahead in these days. And it's, it can be so discouraging, demoralizing, that after so many years of conflict, we can't understand that we are image bearers of God. On both sides of that border, there are people who bear the image of God. On both sides of that conflict, there are people who God says, they are mine. They belong to me. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees of that time, you have a problem 
with the marginalized people coming and worshiping me as God? You're asking me who I should pay taxes or whether it's lawful? I'm telling you this. Each one of you Pharisees in this place, you better prepare yourself because guess who's coming to dinner? Amen. I remember, you remember that Sydney 48 movie? Guess who's coming to dinner? Jesus is saying, I'm about to tear the veil on this temple and there will no longer be a segregated worshiping community on Sunday. Dr. King said this. Dr. Martin Luther King said, Sunday is the most segregated day in society because that's the day when everybody goes to churches that say what they believe, worship and break bread with people who, who act like them and talk like them. The vision of the beloved community, the vision of the kingdom of God, as told to us in Daniel and Revelation, is that at the end of time, people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language will be worshiping as one. That's the vision that God has. People with different, different racial backgrounds, different uh, socioeconomic, different uh, gender, different identities. There's going to be people from all kinds of backgrounds, and not everyone is going to look, think, and talk like you. That's what Jesus is saying. Prepare yourself, because they bear the image of God. If, if you come to church at Union Church, I pray that at least one day, one moment during the, the worship experience, you feel a little bit uncomfortable, okay? I hope you feel a little bit uncomfortable, not because I'm trying to rattle your cage or that's the goal of church. When we come to church, we come to worship God. But if you worship God with us here at Union Church, you're going to sit next to somebody that you might identify with and you might not identify with. And you know what I think? I think that's good. That's a healthy thing. It's a healthy thing. It's a challenging thing. It's a difficult thing. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you guys have created this caste system. You've created this system where people, you get to decide who comes in and who comes out. I'm telling you, I'm the king, and I'm letting them all in. I'm letting them all in. Amen? I thank God because I'm one of those riffraff that God let in. Amen? <laughs> I'm one of the folks that God said, He's been washed by the blood. He recognizes how much he needs me, and that's all it took, amen? The, the thief on the cross said, Jesus, when you're up in heaven, just remember me. Never got baptized, never went to catechism, never went to, to, to a polity course, never took a new member's class, and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. I love this God that we serve. He's not a God of, of, of dogma. He's a God of grace. He's not a God that is exclusively passionate about holiness and righteousness, which he is. He's also a God that exudes the mercy and the welcome that extravagantly is characterized by Jesus. Let us remember this day, friends. Let us remember as we filter all the information that's happening, there are people on the other side of whatever conflict we may engage in, and they are image bearers of God. If we can live life where we don't just say, yeah, I... I, I I have tolerance for that. Jesus didn't say tolerate your neighbor. Jesus didn't say tolerate your, your enemy. What did he say? He said love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Pray for your enemy. If they ask you for a coat, give them two. If they ask you to walk a mile, go two. Jesus says it doesn't make it easy. You don't just, we don't just tolerate our neighbors. We don't just put up with it. We love them. We pray for them. We bless them. In order to do that, we have to see them past themselves and see the image of God in them. When you can see the image of God in them, something miraculous happens. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you that you saw the Imago Day in each and every one of us today. God, when we come into this house, God, we don't come as visitors. We don't come as guests. We come, God, as sons and daughters of the King. Lord, we come into our Father's house. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, God, that just as this passage says, you, in fact, God, you are no respecter of persons, God, rich or poor, God, able-bodied or not, Lord. Lord, you welcome us into this house. Lord, I pray that this morning you would supernaturally transform our eyes. God, we're not there yet. Lord, I'm not there yet. God, I still need you to help me see the divine in every single person I encounter. God, I confess my judgment. I confess my frustration. God, I confess my desire to control, my desire to have people do what I want. God, help me to not 
live my life conditionally and transactionally, God, but may I live it through the eyes of seeing every person I come into contact as image bearers of the divine. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Reuben. Will everyone please take a moment of silent reflection on Pastor Reuben's message as we play the interlude. Thank you for that, Dan and Jen, and for the whole worship team. I felt like the worship today really uh, set the tone. I was very blessed by uh, the offering that everybody brings into this house. It's been such a blessing. We want to just quickly have an opportunity for you to contribute this morning towards all that God is doing through us and in us. Amen. Uh, we have offering envelopes for those of you who would like to contribute today, and we also have ways for folks to give digitally. We know that offering isn't just about financially supporting. It's also bringing just our gifts and our talents. Uh, we've been sharing for the last few weeks um, how much we appreciate just the, the, the extravagant generosity in this community. We have ways for folks to get involved that include uh, serving in the different capacities during our, during our worship service as well as gardening and doing outreach to our, our unhoused neighbors throughout the week. So if you uh, feel led, if you... Um, understand the value of uh, the gifts that God brings into your hands, I want to invite you to be as generous as you can today. I want to invite the ushers to go forward this morning, and Dan is going to lead us in a piece as we bring our gifts to God. you to stand on your, on your feet if you are able to this morning as we sing this doxology in response to all that God has provided to us. Gracious and loving God, we thank you. Thank you for providing for us, God. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, you promise that even though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. So, God, we thank you that you provide enough, God. You provide more than enough, God, so that we can live this life not based on scarcity, not based on fear, God, but out of abundance, God, and out of gratitude. We ask that you bless each and every one of us here in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. 
I want to invite our sister Alicia uh, to come up. And we have a few announcements to let you know what's going on in the life of the church. Please uh, give a very warm applause to sister Alicia for chairing this morning. <laughs> Okay, we have a lot of announcements, so I will try to get through them quickly for all of you. Here are these wonderful opportunities. Saturday morning prayer, still happening, still online. You can still attend in your PJs. Just click the Zoom link, keep your camera off, and pray for half an hour, and go back to bed. <laughs> Sunday, Bible study with Pastor Ken, still happening, still online. It's really good. I totally advocate for this one. Pastor Ken was the one who did our Bible reading today. Um, next Sunday, does anyone know what time we are meeting for church? 10 a.m., that's correct. Not 11 a.m. like today. It's going to be 10 a.m. because at 11 a.m. we're having a congregational meeting. Um, we're going to come back to that. Um, at uh, 12, 10 p.m., right after the congregational meeting, we are going to have October Fall Festival with lunch. Yay, food. We all love food. So please bring a salty or savory snack to share. And you will bring that at 10 a.m. Because that's when church will start. <laughs> all right. There is a movie night, another movie night. Coming on November 4th. What are we watching, Vessi? Billions. It is a comedic Christmas movie with no subtitles. <laughs> you have never watched it? Come watch it. All right. And lastly, what time is uh, church next week? It's uh, 10 a.m. Good. I have driven here at the wrong time before. This is why I say it three times. All right. Harvest Concert. Harvest Concert is on November 12th, and we have a video for that. You know? Is church next week? <laughs> Just a quick reminder don't sleep on the food. I know when people say, well, it's a church potluck. This church, if you haven't been a part of our potlucks in the past, they don't sleep on them. It's great food. It's catered by one of our local businesses here, a Hawaiian uh, a catering company called Aloha Cafe. So there's like short ribs, there's uh, Chinese chicken, there is all kinds of wonderful stuff. We're going to have candy for the kids at each table. There's going to be wonderful events. It's October, so there's going to be October Oktoberfest root beer. <laughs> so we're going to have root beer floats. <laughs> it's going to be a wonderful time. Um, and also with the, with the, um, the drumming, the cultural uh, event that we have, if you haven't heard these drums, uh, oftentimes people will play them outdoors, which have a powerful effect in this sanctuary it's going to boom it's going to sound pretty legit so if you haven't uh, had a chance to experience that very much encourage you to, to to make plans to stick around for that 
Join me this morning in a word of prayer uh, as we give the closing benediction. This benediction comes from the Imago Day that we've been reflecting on today. So pray with me as we say, Lord, you said that each of us have been created in your image, which can be difficult to understand when we see so much brokenness in the world. Yet when we choose to look within, it's possible to see the miracle that you love someone just like us. Teach us to love, Lord, so that you have loved us in a way that the world might be better, God. Lord, teach us to be good neighbors, not just to those who live nearby, but to everyone that we meet. God, I ask that you teach us to look at, at others through your eyes. Value every single person as one that is worthy, as one who have been called to live free of exploitation. Use us and your church to be a voice for those who are voiceless, God. Lord, I pray that you would change the way that we see the world so that we can see it through the eyes of your love. And we ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Ruben. We're going to bring the team back up for one more song. And uh, this is going to be a country arrangement of a very traditional hymn called Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And it's going to start off with a solo. Jin is going to switch instruments from the violin to the fiddle. You may stand if you are able, or you may sit if you don't have any feelings. <laughs> Let it be, 
let it be. Thank you very much. Amen. And a special thanks to those of you who are trying to clap on two and four. Really yeah. appreciate it. Have a great week. We'll see you next week, everybody.